I actually got the airplane in October of 2016, but I started the process of acquiring the airplane many months before that. So I, it, it's a long story. I'll kind of give you the short version here, but you know, I've done aerobatics most of my adult life and most of my adult life I've done aerobatics in biplanes. And so I've got lots of pits time, Christian Eagle time. I've flown a lot of other different type of aerobatic airplanes, but I wanted to do something different. I wanted to find something unique and I always loved the sound and the growl of the Sukhois and the Yaks. And I'm like, okay, I want something different. The Yak 54, it's a very rare airplane. They only built 15 of them. There's only about 12 left in existence. And the best of my knowledge is only about eight, maybe nine flying. And so, I love it. To me, it's a sexy airplane. It's got the growl of a World War II airplane. It's the, the canopy has got the kind of the sexiness of like an F-14 Tomcat uh, canopy. And so for me, it's kind of like the sexiness of a jet with the uh, just the, the growl of a World War II fighter and the performance of an aerobatic airplane. So I'm like, okay, this is a lot of cool airplanes wrapped up into one. And so I'm like, okay, I got to get one of these. And I came across this airplane and they were all tore apart. They were all in primer. Uh, and being that I know how to restore airplanes, I thought, wow, what a great opportunity to get one. So uh, two of them had been sold. There was a deal on the last, there was a deal on the third one. I literally bought the last one. Now, as irony would have it, everybody bought the ones that looked the same first and mine looked a little different. And so I, I guess everybody thought maybe it was the run of the litter or something. And so I bought the one that was left and come to find out the one I got is serial number one. It's the prototype. It's the one that has the logbook entry. If you go to Wikipedia and look at the first flight, that first flight happened in my bird. And so I've got the only pre-production model in existence. So, you know, and I didn't find that out till after I got it, of course, but with that came all the blueprints, all the documentation, all the certification, all of it in Cyrillic or Russian, which I can't read any of, but it's really cool. But I've got all these blueprints. So I literally got the entire history. I got like the Smithsonian Institute history of the Yak-54. It's, it's amazing. Just books and books and reams of information on this airplane. So I get this thing, I buy it sight unseen. Uh, I had an engine test done. They sent me video of it. They sent me bore scope. So, you know, I did what I could, but I, I, I didn't fly to France where it was, it, where it was. I just said, put it in a box and ship it. And so they did put it in a box and they shipped it. And I was hoping to have it come over in uh, July. But ironically, in France, they take the month of July off. And, and when I say they, I mean as a country. Here I am, my plane's broke down, it's crated, it's ready to go, can't get it picked up, had to wait a month on it. So it finally ships. Here's another irony. We had had one of the quietest hurricane years we'd ever had. Being in Florida, you know, hurricanes are a way of life. It had been quiet, 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 quiet. So they put my plane on a boat, it comes over, and this hurricane called Matthew springs out of nowhere. And it's a category four hurricane in the Straits of Florida while my plane is on a boat in the Straits of Florida. So my Yak-54 is on a boat in the Straits of Florida during Hurricane Matthew when it's category four. And so honestly, when the truck shows up, I didn't know if I was gonna open the door and have an air airplane or a crumpled up beer can. I really didn't know. And so when I opened that door and we started extracting the airplane, I just kept waiting to see the problem, see the problem, see the problem. As it would turn out, we had some very minor scuffs, some very minor abrasions, nothing but cosmetic, easily fixed. And so, you know, you can see this airplane, it was like a berth. Uh, the, you know, a truck is eight feet wide. And as you can see from the, the video, my tail is about nine feet wide. So this plane had to be jigged and literally put in at like a 45 degree angle in the truck to get it out. So extracting it with the forklift uh, was very challenging. We literally had inches on either side to get this thing out. And so it was a very slow process pulling it. I pulled it out myself because I'm like, okay, if this thing hits the, if this thing hits, it's on me. And as you can see, it came out, we got it on the ground. 
and then the next thing we had to do was get it out of the jig and get it on the landing gear. Now, that sounds like it would be pretty easy, but I'll tell you what, we wrestled with that titanium landing gear. We wrestled getting it to where the pins would go through it for hours trying to get that thing set. But we finally got it, we finally got it set, we finally got it on the ground and on its own gear, and we did that the first day. So, I mean, that was literally day one, and then, we, and then it was Christmas. Let's start unpacking the boxes, the prop, all the parts. Now, of course, this is where the fun started because all the instructions for disassembly were in French, which I do not speak. Everything else on the airplane was in Russian, which I most certainly do not speak. And the fact that there's only 12 of these left in existence means there's not a lot of authorities around to tell you how to work on one of these. So it was kind of interesting in the fact that this was my first restoration where I didn't take it apart. Because when you take it apart, you document the disassembly process so it's very easy to reverse it when it comes back together. What I got was a semi-tractor trailer full of parts with basically no instructions and bags of parts, which I had to identify because they were all labeled in French. So, and not very good French. Uh, it was just kind of like with a Sharpie. You see the airplane coming out as a fuselage. So the first thing we had to do is get the fuselage on the gear so that we could get it out of the cradle. So the first thing was to get it on the gear. Then we had to take it farther apart. So once we got it on the gear, then the cows came off the engine came off, the engine cradle came off, basically stripped it down to the firewall, and the engine had to go out for uh, for service. And so, because uh, this plane had been sitting for eight years, so every system, every wire, every hose, every nut, every bolt had to be gone through on this airplane. Now, the crazy thing was it only had 300 and change total time hours on the airplane, and so it's a very, very low time airframe. But when you let something sit in a warehouse for eight years, everything made out of rubber or everything that deteriorates, hoses, all that, it all had to be thrown away and scrapped and redone. So we literally had to redo the airplane and could take it literally completely apart and then bring it back together system by system. So as you can see, the cows came off, then the engine came off, then the engine cradle came off, and then we started the, the stripping process and getting it ready to come back into primer and paint. And at that point, we started putting pieces together, but we had to go through the wings and go through everything. We had to go through the wiring. We had to go through the avionics. Uh, the avionics in this airplane were basically junk. So we basically got the plane done, got the plane flying. Once we proved that it would fly, it then went down for another year while we put a modern Garmin G3X package in it and uh, moved it to modern avionics, modern radios. But uh, it was a process of, uh, you know, just take it apart, go through the system, put it back together again. You know, the beautiful thing is, is although the airframe is fairly unique, the uh, M14 uh, class of engines, the M14P, the M14PF, uh, is used in a lot of applications. It's used in the Yak-54, it's used in the Yak-55, uh, it's used in the Sukhoi, 26, 29, 31, and then uh, the, the Pitts Model 12, and then there's some other variants, uh, Yak variants in there that use this engine. So the engine is used in a lot of applications. So there's literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of airplanes that use the M14 or PF engine that basically designates a 360 or 400 horsepower engine. Yeah, another thing I do wanna give a shout out though, uh, M14P out in Kingman, Arizona, those folks out there were instrumental in helping me get this airplane going and keeping it going. They they redid the ignition system. They uh, we we got a we got a custom fuel injection system. We did a lot of really cool stuff to bump up the horsepower from 360 to probably about 450, and really give it a lot more go go. But they were instrumental and have been at getting the airplane built and then maintaining it once I once I got it back into service. In the next video, what I really want to cover is how we came about designing and implementing and applying the paint job because it's not just a, hey, that's cool. There's a lot of reasoning that went into uh, air show competition applications for this paint job, uh, as well as the fun. And the avionics package was, we, we did a lot of mock-up, but it was all about creating something that would work well in a very fast paced environment. And so it'll be fun unpacking that and, and talking about how it got the way it, you know, it is.